Hello. And so to our, our second keynote for, for this morning. Um, across the road from these exhibition buildings is the Royal Society of Victoria. I think I must have driven past that white building for about 40 years before I actually realised what it was. It's a beautiful building and it's wonderful to work, walk inside. It's uh, the most amazing geographical location and it has this wonderful history. Our second keynote speaker, Dave Griggs, spoke there about 18 months ago in a truly memorable speech that clearly showed the inextricable links between history and geography. In that speech, he told of his work with the Yorta Yorta people. He spoke of how the stories of the elders were in danger of being lost. He spoke of the lack of engagement of the young with these stories. But then Dave told us about his project, a project that involved young Aboriginals who had their heads around technology, young Aboriginals who ultimately became engaged with the elders and who jumped at the chance to use the, their GPS and mobile devices to go out and record those stories. So those stories will never be lost. It, sh it clearly shows those wonderful links between history and geography. But that was 18 months ago. Now, Dave is actually the Professor of Sustainable Development at Monash University and Warwick University. Until recently, he was Director of the Monash Institute of Science. Dave has also a wonderful link um, as far as being involved with creating the Sustainable Development Goals. He also wants to see those Sustainable Development Goals being implemented in Australia. We look forward to hearing Dave today talk about the challenge as to how we may be able to implement those goals in our backyard. So I'd like you to welcome Professor Dave Griggs to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Libby. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I was really pleased to hear that first presentation and the aims of the, the new geography curriculum because if you notice the fifth bullet there was I can't remember the exact phrase uh, about preparing students to be good global citizens. And I think it said, in a world that's uh, environmentally and economically sustainable and socially just. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about uh, in the sort of second half of my presentation. In the first half, I'm going to talk a bit about climate change uh, because we thought it would be a good idea for you to get a little bit of an update on the latest in terms of the science of climate change. So I'll just be a second while I bring up my... Can someone tell me how to uh, make it full screen? Okay. You'll see this in a minute. I can see it now, but you'll see it in a minute. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a little video clip, and it only runs for about 10 seconds, so I'll show it a couple of times. So the first thing about climate change, you hear a lot about it in the media and all over the place, uh, although surprisingly little about it in the, in the election campaign. Um, and th the real question, is the first question you ask yourself with climate change is, is the climate changing? So this little video shows the temperature of the Earth. It's a map of the Earth. It shows the temperature of the Earth from about 1950 through to the present day. The, the, blue, the bluer it gets, the colder it gets, and the redder it gets, the hotter it gets. So you can be able to judge for yourself whether the world has warmed or not since about 1950. And what you can see is it pulses in and out uh, all the time. So that's the natural sort of what we call the variability of the climate system because we get some hot, hot days and cold days, hot weeks and cold weeks, hot seasons and cold seasons. But I think you can see that over that period of time, there has been a systematic change. So I'll just run that quickly again so that you can see. Um, 
And what we've seen is, since the, bit the beginning of the 20th century, we've seen a warming of almost one degree Celsius now in the average global temperature of the Earth. And, and that's taken place, at the most, a lot of that warming has taken place in the, the sort of northern hemisphere land masses because the, the, uh, the land absorbs heat much quicker than the ocean. The, the oceans have a huge capacity to absorb heat, whereas the land warms up quicker than the oceans. And because the southern hemisphere is mo more ocean than land, the southern hemisphere temperatures uh, have been sort of lagging behind the northern hemisphere temperatures. So if you look at that in terms of uh, what it is on a global basis, if you look at this top graph, each one of the, the little columns on this shows the average temperature of the world in that year. And again, you can see that you, know, that you get some warm years and cold years, even some runs of warm years and cold years. But what you see over that period of, since about the beginning of the 20th century is a, a significant warming. And until the last couple of years, we, we, people were saying, well, you know, 1998 was the warmest year. Therefore, and, and after that, you know, global warming, it, it had sort of flattened off for the next 10 years. Um, and so climate change just happened to all go away. If you listen to Andrew Bolt, that's what he was saying. Um, not, not my chosen source, but there you go. Um, and we know that in, during El Nino years, El Nino is a natural variability in the climate system. During El Nino years, we, we have an El Nino now. Um, the global temperatures are, are warmer than they are during La Nina years. And so we, we had an El Nino here, we had a La Nina, and now we've gone back into El Nino again. And so what, that's why over these last two years, we've seen this extremely rapid rise in global temperatures. And just to give you the latest, uh, the latest noise on what's happening to these global temperatures, over the first four months of this year, Every one of those months has not only set a record for the warmest month of that type. So January was the warmest January ever, February the warmest February ever, March the warmest March ever, and April the warmest April ever. They have been the warmest by the biggest amount ever. So um, temperatures this year are just going absolutely crazy. And if that persists for the rest of the year, that we're, we're predicting the La Nina to the, the El Nino to fade towards the end of the year, so it might not be so prediction, but it's almost certain already that this year will, will exceed uh, last year in terms of uh, global temperatures. And if it continues as it is, you can see that temperature margin there. Well, 2016 would be higher by a higher margin than that. So 2016 is on track to be somewhere up here, which is you know, really quite scary. And if you look at it on a decadal time scale, these just average them over 10 years. We can see every 10 years for the last 40 years has been you know, a step up in terms of global warming. So the atmosphere and the oceans have warmed. Uh, the amount of snow and ice around the world has decreased. Sea levels have risen and so on. So when we look at um, climate change, we don't just look at temperatures. And we don't just look at temperatures um, here on land. So here are some other changes, because if, we, if climate change is real, we would expect to see other changes happening in the climate system. And what you see here is what we call uh, upper ocean heat content. And as I said at the beginning, the oceans have a huge capacity to absorb heat. They're like a, a big sort of thermal store, if you like. So when you measure the heat content of the oceans, it's actually probably a better measure of climate change than the temperature of the Earth, because the temperature on land goes up and down all the time, um, whereas the oceans average all of that out. So when you look at the, the heat content of the oceans, you can see that that also is rising steadily. If you look at sea level rise, um, that's also going up. Why does sea level rise when we get uh, increasing temperatures? Well, the obvious one is that some of the ice that's on the land in the forms of glaciers and ice sheets melts and flows into the oceans. But the principal reason is that um, as water gets warmer, it just ex expands due to thermal expansion and, and the sea levels rise. So uh, we've seen a, a, a steady increase in sea level rise, first of all from tide gauges and then from satellite measurements. So over the sort of um, 1901 to 2010, so just over 100 years, we've seen sea level rise by about 19 centimetres, and that's a figure to just keep in mind for later. Uh, we've seen the amount of spring uh, snow cover decrease by about 40% since the 1960s, so there's about 40% 40, um, 40 less uh, snow and ice. <coughs> and then this one is really dramatic. This is the Arctic summer sea ice extent. 
So this is the amount of ice at the North Pole. Now there's no land at the North Pole. At the South Pole, the, the ice sits on the Antarctic continent. There's actually land under there. But at the North Pole, there's no land. It just It's like an ice cube floating in your drink. The ice sheet at the North Pole just sits there and floats on the water. And every year during the Northern Hemisphere summer, it shrinks. And every year during the Northern Hemisphere winter, it grows again. And so it grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks every year. So what you do to, to measure how it's changing is you measure it at the same time every year. And so this is measured in September each year when the ice is at its smallest extent. So that's the end of the Northern Hemisphere summer when the ice is at its lowest extent. And what we've seen is an extremely dramatic reduction in the area of ice at the North Pole. It's gone down by about half. Um, and not only has the area gone down by half, it's also got significantly thinner. And it's actually quite an interesting story about how we know that, because we can measure the height at the top very easily from satellites. We just bounce radars off them, and we can measure the height very easily. What we can't measure very easily is how much there is underneath, because as everybody knows, the largest amount of ice is underneath. Uh, but we knew that um, American and Russian submarines had been you know, sailing under there since about the 1960s. Of course, they didn't want to admit that they'd been doing that because the Russians didn't want to tell the Americans and the Americans didn't want to tell the Russians. Um, and so they wouldn't release the data because they didn't want to admit that they'd been doing it. It took us about 20 years to convince them to release that data. Uh, and when, it, when they did, of course, we found what we all expected to find, that was that the ice has um, thinned extremely rapidly. Uh, and in terms of the predictions here, um, when we first made a prediction about that the ice at the northern North Pole would disappear by the end of this century, the, the institute I was leading at the time was the first one to make that prediction, we were attacked by everybody because nobody could really can get their head around the fact that there's likely to be an ice-free North Pole by, by the end of this century. Uh, but now I think it's just, yeah, everybody expects that. Um, nobody's, nobody's questioning it. The only question is when. Some people are saying as short as 30 years from now. Some people, by the end of the century, best estimates are somewhere in the region of 2060 to 2080. But you know, it all depends on how much greenhouse gas we emit over that period. Um, and by ice-free, I, I have to say that we actually, being scientists, we define everything. So by ice-free, we say less than 10% ice cover. And the reason we say that is because otherwise there'll be some iceberg. In about 2080, there'll be some iceberg floating across the North Pole, and somebody will say, ha-ha, we told you that, you know, that it was, wasn't going to be ice-free. Um, so we actually define it as less than 10%. And then this is another interesting one. Um, we think we know what's causing all of this, which I'll get onto. It's, it's the, the amount of greenhouse gases we emit, particularly carbon dioxide. But we also realize that that carbon dioxide, as a gas, also dissolves into the ocean. And so someone actually had the bright idea of actually looking into the ocean to see how much dissolved carbon dioxide there was. Uh, and sure enough, carbon dioxide concentrations have increased. And so then if you actually look what's happening in the oceans, carbon dioxide, CO2, combines with seawater, H2O, and forms carbonic acid, HCO3. So um, we would expect to see the oceans start to become more acidic. And of course, you know, if you know your pH scale, the smaller the number, the higher the acidity. And we've seen a, a rapid reduction in the pH of our seawater. So in other words, our seawater is becoming rapidly more acidic. So that's a very quick uh, summary of climate change in five, ten minutes. Um, we think we know what's causing it, which is the greenhouse effect. All of the, I'm sure you've, you've taught this, so you don't need me to explain it to you. All of the energy in the Earth comes from the sun. That passes through the atmosphere largely unchecked. Some of it bounces back off the clouds, but most of it passes through and heats the, the surface of the Earth. The Earth, then, if it didn't do anything that, the Earth would get hotter and hotter, so the Earth re-radiates that radiation back out to space. But whereas it was coming in as ultraviolet radiation or shortwave radiation, it radiates it back out as longwave or infrared radiation. Those wavelengths are absorbed by certain gases in the atmosphere. We call them the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, CFCs, and so on. And so the more of those atmosphere gases there are in the atmosphere, the more of that heat gets trapped and you know, it warms up. It's not rocket science. People think climate change is a new thing. Um, Fourier in 19, 1827 was the first one who, who essentially out, outlined that principle. Uh, and then John Tyndall in 1881 was the first one who, who actually carried out an experiment to show how carbon dioxide 
traps heat at the, at the wavelength at which the Earth re-emits. Uh, and then the first global warming prediction was made by Sventi Arrhenius in 1896, who predicted that for a doubling of carbon dioxide, we would lead to about a five degrees warming. We currently think it's about three, three and a half degrees. So he actually did a pretty good job considering he didn't have all the supercomputers that we have today. And it's again another interesting little side story that the reason uh, we, we, we have uh, Sventi Arrhenius's girlfriend to thank for the fact that he did that calculation because she dumped him. Uh, and he was so upset that he sort of locked himself away in his room for a couple of years to do the calculation and made the first global warming prediction. So, so thank you to Sventi Arrhenius's girlfriend for dumping him. So this is, this is the future we're facing. So if we continue to emit a lot of greenhouse gases, this is the temperature increase we'll see. If we manage to stop increasing greenhouse gases over the next sort of five to 10 years, this is what the, the world's governments say they want to do, which is limit global warming to no more than two degrees. Uh, and what a colleague of mine did was, um, I shall just check the time. Yeah, we're still good. Um, what a colleague of mine did was put these on it. Uh, and this is a really scary thing to do because the first thing you have to do is put yourself on here. And so the first thing you have to do is assume when you're going to die. Uh, and so the temptation is to run this line all the way out somewhere out here. Um, but being a good scientist, I took the average life expectancy of someone my age. And then I put my kids. My kids were born in the sort of late 80s. Uh, they're 31 and 29 now. Um, so, you know, the climate change they can expect to see in their lifetime is more like here to here. And then these grandchildren are hypothetical at the moment, although I keep telling them to get on with it. <laughs> uh, and I did, I, I always knew I'd be in trouble if my kids ever saw this, but there was always, there was no danger of that because they, they, they're in the UK, except my daughter did actually come to Australia, see me give this presentation, and I got in a lot of trouble. Um, but, the, you know, the, the kids that you're teaching... Um, will see in their lifetime a climate change from sort of here you know, up to here. So, that, so that's the kind of thing that you know, you're, you're expecting. So um, before I start the next one, I'm just going to say, right, that's the end of the climate change. Now I'm going to move more into, uh, if you think climate change is a problem, there are also other problems in the world and, and how we actually try and manage the world more sustainably. So the next thing is a little three-minute video so that I get a bit of a break and you get a bit of a break from me. Now, why isn't the sound on? There we go. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. 
We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. Okay, apparently it's time to replace the lamp and it's going to go dead in about 10 minutes. So, so it seems to be cursed, this presentation. Anyway, well, here we go. So what that's saying is that as human beings now, because of the rapid population increase we've seen since the 1950s, we are now affecting the Earth's natural systems at a scale as large as or larger than those natural systems themselves. So we move more sediment and rock, we manage the land outside the ice sheets and so on. So it doesn't matter whether you look at things like population or GDP or direct investment or damming of rivers or urban population or paper consumption or deforestation, a whole range of things, even the number of McDonald's restaurants. The, the shape of these graphs are all the same. They're all this exponential increase. So the, the stress we're putting on our natural systems is increasing exponentially. So when you look at how the natural systems are responding, they're responding not surprisingly in exactly the same way. So what do we do about that? So when we look at, try, you know, can, are we currently in a space which is, you know, where humanity can operate safely? A group of scientists did this exercise where they looked at a number of areas and found that if you're in this sort of green circle, you're sort of still okay. Um, and if you're outside the green circle, you're not. And in terms of climate change, we've already exceeded, you know, what we consider to be safe. Uh, in global biodiversity loss, we've just completely blown it off the off the face of the planet. I mean, we've, we're in the sixth great mass extinction of species. We're losing species at a rate faster today than at any time in Earth's history, and that includes when the dinosaurs died out. Uh, estimates are very difficult to make about how much we're likely to lose over the coming, you know, by the end of the century, because we don't even know how many species we've got on the Earth. We're still finding new species every day. But when you do those calculations, the best estimates are something in the range of 25 to 40 percent of every species on Earth is likely to be lost by the end of this century. Uh, and also in terms of uh, what we call the biogeochemistry of the nitrogen cycle, so applying nitrogen fertilizers and so on. So we're clearly not in a safe operating space at the moment. So if that's something we've learned, a, a prerequisite for human, future human development, including poverty reduction, is the safe, fu safe functioning of this, of this system. But since 2000, our accumulated research shows us that this is at risk and further human pressure may lead to large-scale and abrupt, irreversible changes. So that's what we're starting to see with all the floods and droughts and fires and so on. So unless future development is carried out in a way that protects the Earth's natural systems, the, the, the potential for large-scale humanitarian crises is significant and could undermine any development gains. And the Sustainable Development Goals are the framework which we've come up with to try and uh, integrate these different uh, requirements. So when they came up with the idea of what they wanted to do this, you may have heard of the Millennium Development Goals. They finished, in the, they finished last year. So we had to come up with something to replace them. We wanted to come up with something which actually embraced sustainable development, so that embraced this environmental aspect as well. So they set themselves a job. And, the, and the first of all, they said we want to continue with the MDGs. So we want to continue to do poverty and health and education and hunger and so on. But also they said, we want to score that sustainable development should be action-oriented, global in nature, um, action-oriented, concise, easy to communicate, limited in number, aspirational, global in nature, universally applicable to all countries, while taking into account different national realities, capacities and levels of development, and respecting national policies and priorities. Try and get 200 governments to do that. Try and get them to agree what to have for lunch would, you know, would take 10 years. So they didn't quite meet all of the, that, because we, I think we probably failed in the concise bit, um, because what we came up with was um, the Sustainable Development Goals, of which there are 17, which I'll show you in a minute. But what, this, what the, the precursor to the goals say is that this, isn't, this agenda is a plan for people, planet, and prosperity. All countries and all stakeholders acting collaboratively in partnership will implement this plan. So these goals apply to Australia. That's a bit of a hard message to tell our government at the moment, but these, these goals all apply to Australia. They are resolved to free the human race from the tyranny of poverty and want to heal and secure our planet. 
We're determined to take the bold and transformative steps which are urgently needed to shift the world onto a sustainable and resilient path. And as we embark on this collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. And that is a, a, a really, really important and transformative statement. Because if you look at development goals in the past, it's always been dealing with the majority. This one actually says that we'll actually deal with the minority as well. We'll, have, we'll leave nobody behind. So it's extraordinarily ambitious. These are the goals. There are 17 of them. And behind these each sit a number of targets. There are 169 targets. And currently there's work to develop those into a whole range of indicators. So it's about eliminating poverty. There's hunger. There's one on health, education, gender. Um, I should know these off by heart. Uh, water, energy, uh, work and economic growth, industry and infrastructure, inequality, um, uh, cities and communities, uh, consumption and production, climate change, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and security, and then one on a partnership for development. So, you know, this is what the world, all of the world's governments have agreed we want to try and achieve by 2030, which is extremely ambitious. Um, in terms of um, implementing them uh, and implementing them in your curriculum, it's still very early days. Uh, there is this group called Education for Sustainable Development. Um, there's a group called the World's Largest Lesson uh, on the website uh, you can see along the bottom here, who are starting to put um, curriculum and lesson plans and so on onto the web for you to use. Um, so you can um, there's, a, there's a little animation that you can show to students. Uh, there are lesson plans. You can upload your own lesson plans. So if you do a lesson, you can upload it onto the web so that other teachers from all over the world um, can use your lesson and your lesson plan. There's a little comic book um, and so on. Most of the, um, you know, the, the, there are some at primary age for ages 8 to 14, 8 to 11. Um, so there's a whole, whole range of those. They're just really starting, as I say, to be developed now because the goals only came into force at the beginning of this year. And then here in Australia, there's a thing that um, what's called the Sustainable Development Solutions Network Youth uh, are doing, which is they're trying to set up a global schools program where um, students will offer to come into the classroom, talk to your students, uh, will help to develop, um, you know, so you'll have young people uh, telling young people all about the sustainable development goals and helping you to work with them in your classroom. And I said that's, that program is just starting to get off the ground now and if you want more information about that you can contact youth at US, unsdsn.org. And uh, thank you for listening. I'll happy to take any questions. Yep, question over here. Yes, um, if you look on the web, the, um, there is a lot of information about that. So it depends whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person. Um, if you're a glass half full person, we made more progress in terms of eliminating poverty and eliminating hunger in the world over the 15 uh, year period of the Millennium Development Goals than we have at any time in, in previous history. They are, well, oh, it's good timing. Um, the, um, the goal to halve the number of people living in poverty and poverty being defined as living on less than $1.25 a day was achieved. Uh, the uh, goal of universal primary education was almost achieved. Um, the primary health care goals were not quite achieved but you know, significant progress was made. Uh, the hunger goal, a million, uh, billions of people were brought out of hunger over that 15-year period. So if you're a glass half full person, th there was significant progress. If you're a glass half empty person, because of the population increase, uh, we still have over a billion people out of the seven point something on the planet at the moment who go to bed hungry every night. Um, we still have um, you know, massive development challenges. What, when we introduced, well, we, I wasn't involved in the Millennium Development Goals. When they introduced the Millennium Development Goal primary education goal, 
Um, they, I think that the target was something like um, you know, to achieve 100% of children going to school. Um, but it didn't have anything about quality of that education in the goal. So a number of countries were meeting that goal by essentially opening schools and saying, yes, there's a place for every child, and we've met the goal. The fact that the children weren't going to school, the teachers weren't qualified, there was no curriculum for them to teach, um, because the, the, you know, there were no toilets in the school, so girls couldn't go, and all of this kind of thing, was all hidden under that big statistic. Um, so the, the sustainable development goals are much more sophisticated in terms of trying to look at not just the bulk numbers, but also the quality and lifelong learning. And all. It brings in that they're much more nuanced than the Millennium Development Goals were. The other argument against the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals was it's all been down to China, uh, because China reduced its level of poverty from about 14%, uh, from about 82% down to about 14%. And of course, there's a lot of people in China, so that brings the whole global numbers down by enormously. And if you say, when people say, well, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, then there was really no change. So glass half full, glass half empty. Um, in my view, the Millennium Development Goals um, were a fantastic thing. They um, really focused the world's donors on the right things, and significant progress was made, but we still have an enormous way to go. Any other questions? There's a microphone wandering around if you want to ask a question. I've either terrified you and depressed you or you you just you're not you're you've got it all all in your heads now and it's all good. Okay. Dave, thank you very much. I think on the graphs and illustrations we see the the link between geography and history in such a key issue of our time. But I think at least there is something positive that we can go back to schools as far as the sustainable development goals, that there is something positive that we can actually focus on as far as addressing this problem in both a geographical, historical and scientific way. Dave, thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's something that's of key importance as we journey forward with the, with the students and we will look forward to hopefully having some more positive resolutions as we um, look towards implementing those sustainable development goals. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise and time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.